So living at the edge of such a rich marine world, the incredible botanical ri richness of coastal California isn't always given the attention that we know it deserves. So it feels really great to spend a day turning our backs to the sea <laughs> and focusing our attention landwards. We should all be aware, as I'm sure most of you are, and that California has the most di diverse flora of any state in the U.S. More than a third of all plant species in the United States grow here naturally or have become naturalized. The state's flora comprises about 7,400 species and subspecies, of which 85% are native and 32% are endemic to California, meaning that they're found nowhere else in the world. So any day that I spend with a hundred or more like-minded biologists and naturalists is a good day. So I'd really like to thank my fellow speakers uh, in particular for attracting everyone here today. Let's see if this works. Yeah. Okay, so what do you suppose the future is going to bring to this iconic California scene? Will these species adapt to rapid environmental change? Will some of them go locally or globally extinct? Will their life cycles and flowering times change in response to climate change such that the timing of their flowering no longer matches the pollinators on which they depend? Will their seeds always be able to germinate in the soil? These are the sorts of questions that I wonder about as I contemplate, contemplate the future of California's flora in this time of such unprecedented environmental and, and political change. Our success in the conservation of this kind of scene depends on so much more than keeping wild places protected from development, from exotic plant species, from the effects of atmospheric nitrogen deposition, and from new herbivores, insect pests, and diseases. Conserving seeds like this also depends on maintaining pollinators, seed dispersers, soil microbes, and providing habitats elsewhere that the seeds of these species can co colonize as this environment deteriorates. And of course, it also depends on developing wildlife management uh, wildfire management strategies that protect both species, both plant species, um, people, and natural habitats. So it's not unreasonable or unwise to think that the most important thing for us to be doing in the face of this environmental degradation is simply to buy, to purchase, to bribe people, uh, to get land that we can protect. But given the decline in natural habitats in California that I've observed over the last four decades, I've come to believe that their conservation also depends on learning as much as we can about these fragile and temporary plant communities and educating others about them. And there are several reasons why I've come to believe this. First, I think that we're more likely to conserve something that's irreplaceable if we know what's unique about it. It's not just a colorful carpet or a green wall of plants. Second, as we lose scenes like this to climate change, wildfire, and development, the more we know about the processes and species that we've lost, the more we may value them and try to save habitats that do survive. And finally, as the number of Californians who are unfamiliar with the outdoors increases, because they spend their childhoods in dense urban or suburban environments or in screen world. If they don't learn how to observe, how to interpret, and how to ask questions about nature during those brief moments when they're immersed in it, then uh, they won't place a high priority on its conservation. As a professor at UCSB, I see the students who emerge after 15 years in the California public school system, right? And um, frankly, most of them are pretty estranged from the natural world, however much time they may have spent surfing and skating and hiking and biking. Um, they still don't have a, a deep awareness of the natural world around them. And I feel like if we don't teach them what they're missing and fast, then they're unlikely to actively try to conserve the world, the natural world, when they do become agents of change as adults. 
So those are a few of my missions. Um, this morning, I'm going to introduce you to three projects that have occupied me over the last few years. And I hope to convey how these projects have been designed to discover how plants will respond to upcoming environmental change, to engage Californians um, and people nationwide in observing wild plants and asking questions about them, and to, pr to provide several research resources that future botanists, naturalists, and evolutionary biologists can use to learn about today's wild plant species, as well as those of the slightly more distant past. So we could maybe lower the lights just a bit. Um, the first project I'm going to tell you about um, involves the conservation of seeds. And this is a project we call Project Baseline, which in a nutshell is a nationwide seed bank for the study of evolutionary change in wild plant species. This project um, was funded by the National Science Foundation. And uh, more specifically, it represents a seed bank, the creation of a seed bank, to study evolutionary responses to environmental change by common widespread species. So the seed bank differs from most, well, really all other seed banks, in that its focus is the preservation of common and widely distributed species, as opposed to, say, crop species or rare and endangered species. And the reason for this is that we wanted to design a seed bank specifically that would capture as much genetic variation as possible. And so this involves studying and conserving seeds from populations of species where the species are very widespread um, across the nation. And this represents a collaboration between myself and two other botanists, each of whom took responsibility for identifying candidate species and collecting them in a different region of the US. Um, just to uh, get cut to the chase, um, this project has resulted in the collection and archiving of over 8 million seeds collected from about 700 populations representing more than 65 wild and naturalized flowering plant species, mostly short-lived herbs. And in California, this has comprised the collection of over 200 populations of 19 species. Um, we have a website, surprise. Um, but I wanted to just uh, point that out while describing a little bit more specifically our mission, because it really is unique among seed banks. Our goal was to establish and to curate a research bank, that would a seed bank, that would be of use to the scientific community. And to that end, seeds are available starting about right now for the next half century to study evolution in wild plant populations using a method that ecologists call the resurrection approach. Briefly, in this approach, resurrected or revived ancestors, in our case seeds, are compared with descendants from the same populations under when both ancestors and descendants are grown under common conditions. So the idea is this. We live in an era of rapid environmental change, let, yet little is known about the evolutionary responses of wild plants to such change. And so we want to set up a resource that future, resource, uh, future researchers, well past the time that I'm done here, will be able to investigate and ultimately to predict plant responses to environmental change. This approach allows us to detect relatively short-term evolution on the timescale of decades to reveal how wild plant populations evolve in response to changes to their environment. And those changes might include, of course, climate change, loss of pollinators, loss of herbivores, increased abundances of invasive species, and any other kind of environmental degradation, or enhancement for that matter, that plant populations may be exposed to. So here's how we would implement it. Dormant seeds of known age, the Project Baseline Seed Bank seeds, for example, would be reared in a common garden alongside their descendants collected from the same site. The differences between ancestral and descendant populations then would represent genetic change because they're grown in the same environment. And um, 
uh, with some exceptions, this genetic change would be the result of short-term evolution. There's some details that we have to consider. We need to rule out the effects of random genetic changes and the possible deterioration of the ancestral seeds, but there are ways that um, we can do that with some experimental tricks. So resurrection is not de-extinction, but it's making use of seeds that remain alive but in a dormant state while their population continues to evolve above, uh, above ground. Okay, so the steps are these. First, genetically di diverse seeds are collected from a wild population and preserved in a dormant state in, say, a seed bank. These seeds represent genetic types or genotypes that are adapted to the field conditions at the time of collection. Now, the field population continues to evolve by natural selection, adapting to new conditions that arise as the environment changes. But those seed, seeds in the seed bank remain as a, a snapshot of that original seed collection. In other words, this is the baseline from which the name Project Baseline is derived. This ancestral, um, sorry, as the field population changes, the um, seeds that, are, that represent that population represent um, both ancestors and descendants. So in um, the descendant population, over the course of time, natural selection has favored genotypes that perform best under the new environmental conditions. And we can sample those adapted genotypes by collecting seeds following that period of evolution. So we've got the ancestral seeds, which were adapted to conditions at the time of collection, and we've got the descendant seeds that are adapted to field conditions at the time of collection, say, decades later. So now what we can do is take a sample of the ancestral seeds from the seed bank and grow them in a common garden alongside the descendant seeds in a common environment. And any differences be observed between ancestors and descendants raised in a common environment will be genetically based. And if these differences are due to natural selection, they represent the result of relatively rapid evolutionary change. And so we're interested in what kinds of traits evolve under natural conditions across a broad landscape of environmental and climatic um, situations. So I wanted just to give you one uh, small tip of the iceberg example of how this approach has been used to predict how species may respond to, for example, a short-term drought. This work was done by one of my Project Baseline colleagues, Steve Franks, and he was studying a population of Brassica rapa in Southern California uh, in the early 1990s during a period of relatively high rainfall. In 1997, he collected seeds from this population and preserved them. And ser serendipitously, that population, subsequent to 1997, appear, uh, experienced a seven-year period of drought. At the end of that period, in 2004, he collected seeds. So we've got ancestral seeds, descendant seeds from the same population. And then he took those seeds, uh, raise them in what we call a refresher population, and then uh, um, uh, raised the following generation um, in a common garden where he had seeds um, of 1997, seeds of 2004, and hybrids between them um, because we would predict that if there are differences between the 1997 and the 2004 seeds, if those are clearly genetically based, then the hybrids should be intermediate in phenotype or in have intermediate traits. And so this just represents um, the partial complexity of the breeding design. He mated 97 plants with uh, 97 plants, 2004 plants with members of the same population, and then he did reciprocal pro crosses between both lineages. And I'm just going to show you one small result. What this graph shows along the x-axis is the number of days between germination and flowering of seeds uh, representing the ancestral population from 1997, 
the descendant seeds from 2004 and the hybrids between them. The 1997 seeds, when grown in 2004, exhibited a first flowering date of about 60 days from germination to flowering. By contrast, the 2004 seeds flowered at about day 45. So following just seven years of drought, the flowering time in this population evolved to become like 15 days earlier. That's a huge amount of temporal change. Um, and as predicted, the hybrids between them exhibited a um, intermediate flowering time, which just like kind of clinches um, the fact that this is a genetically determined difference. So we see a very rapid rate of evolutionary change following what's now become just a routine um, drought event. Um, and while we might not worry about whether Brassica rapa starts flowering too early for its pollinators to visit it, um, for many wild species, a two-week earlier flowering time might totally miss their pollinators preventing their successful seed production but we don't know how widespread that hypothetical scenario might be, and this is why we um, designed this genetic resource. So I feel like this resurrection paradigm um, can aid and inform conservation in, in a few ways. First, we can measure responses to changing conditions, and I hope this means that we will also be able to predict responses to changing conditions and perhaps target those species that might be vulnerable, for example, to missing their pollinators. Obviously, this method allows us and is designed to preserve genetic variation from the past, which might be important for restoration efforts in the future. And we may also be able to ident identify conditions, ecological conditions, that promote the loss of genetic diversity. If we see a difference in diversity, for example, between the past and the ancestral and descendant generations. These are just a few of the 19 species that we collected in California. Um, iconic species that um, I would hope that most plant-friendly Californians would um, be able to recognize. Um, but most importantly, I really want to acknowledge Heather Schneider, who was the postdoc in my lab, who led the on-the-ground um, tiny army, an army that you could count on one hand, basically, of um, uh, co-workers um, with whom she collected populations of all of these species over a three-year period all over California. An incredible effort. Um, these seeds are preserved um, through a memorandum of understanding at the USDA National Center for Genetic Resources Conservation in Fort Collins. Uh, many of them are under liquid nitrogen to preserve them with little deterioration, um, at least for decades, if not centuries. Okay, the second project I'd like to tell you about is the California Phenology Project, which is a statewide citizen science program designed to track the effects of climate change on the seasonal cycles of native plants in California. This project was funded by the National Park Service, um, which ran a competitive uh, grant program uh, in 2011, to which I applied with several um, colleagues and National Park staff, who I'll mention in a moment. Um, and without this funding, um, your tax dollars at work, thank you, um, this never would have gotten um, even started. Um, I'll refer to the California Phenology Project as the CPP in order to shave about 32 seconds off this talk. Okay, you're probably all familiar with phenology. Most succinctly, it's the study of recurring, usually seasonal, plant and animal life cycle stages, which we call phenophases. And most recently, um, this phenomenon, or the study of phenology, has been done in the context of climate change by asking how the timing of these phenophases, the onset, the duration, the termination, are influenced by climatic conditions. Phenophases that you'd be really familiar with include bud break, the timing of the appearance of new leaves, which in California typically occurs at the onset of the, the winter rains, um, or following episodic rainfall events uh, later in the spring. 
flowering, um, of course, is the, our, our most prominent phenophase, which um, can refer simply to the appearance of flower buds or open flowers or both. So what were the goals of the CPP? Well, we started out with a number of scientific goals. First, we wanted to design and then to implement phenological monitoring in seven national parks. That's how far we felt we could stretch our funding. Um, but later, we extended this to several UC reserves and botanic gardens using standardized protocols that we could train members of the public to use in a reliable way. We wanted to cover a large geographic area and broad environmental uh, gradients so that we could ca observe, capture, record, and analyze phenological variation across a wide range of climatic conditions to see if plants were sensitive to climate. We wanted then to measure the effects of local climate on the timing of seasonal events in the plants that were living in those local sites in order to be able to predict responses to climate change. Now, of course, climate change is going to be a slow and long process, but we knew that we could use spatial variation in climate as a proxy for temporal variation in order to predict how the timing of phenological events will respond to future climatic conditions. In other words, if we find that under in dry locations, um, the phenology of a given species is advanced or happens you know, two weeks earlier than in, uh, under wet conditions, we might predict that as our environment dries, if it does, that that species will exhibit an earlier or advanced phenology. And those predictions can be quite precise depending on the complexity of one's models or analyses. We thought we might be able, with 30 species, to identify those whose growth and reproduction are most sensitive to climate particularly to stressful conditions. Um, and there are a number of reasons why we felt the public should care about this. First, the seasonal availability and abundance of many food sources for birds and animals might change if the phenology of those species changes. And many of our most important and iconic wildlife species depend on common species like oaks, buckeye, elderberry, manzanita, where if the phenology of those species changes, then the food sources for these animals might also change. And there might be periods of food scarcity simply because the phenology is changing. Um, it may also be worthwhile to point out that many native species flowers, so plant species flowers, are used by wild pollinators that also pollinate our crops. So if the timing and availability of native plant species flowering time changes, this might negatively affect crop production. At the ecological level, if interdependent species, mu mutualistically beneficial species, respond differently to climate change, say plants and their pollinators, then phenological mismatches can develop, causing these mutualistic relationships to break down, hurting both the plant and their pollinator, or both the plant and their seed disperser. Alternatively, changes in plant phenology might expose plant populations to herbivores that they had previously escaped in time. And we don't know to what extent this might happen in California or elsewhere. And then finally, land managers and the public really kind of want to know what's in store. And so when they go to national parks, for example, and ask what those parks are doing to observe, to track, or to respond to climate change, the CPP can begin to provide them with an answer. Um, we had a number of public service goals since this was a, a nationally funded, uh, government funded um, project. Um, the National Park um, resource managers were very curious about how our work might inform their, their own. Um, processes like weed management de depend very uh, closely on when weeds, for example, are producing their fruits and seeds. And so land managers are very interested in having that kind of calendar for um, noxious plant species as well as for native ones. We wanted to be able to educate park visitors, prepare them to observe and, and to describe changes in the landscape and have a vocabulary for doing so, since many people don't. And finally, and, and most selfishly, this was my most uh, 
uh, the goal of most interest to me, was to engage the public in genuine research that would generate observations that I could use to ask scientific questions. So um, our uh, focal sites to begin with were seven pilot parks. We would have um, implemented monitoring much more broadly, but our funding was um, limited. So we chose three coastal parks, Redwood, uh, Golden Gate, Santa Monica Mountains, and John Muir um, stepped in because I was a very enthusiastic um, uh, park ranger there. Um, two uh, Montane um, sites, Lassen and Sequoia and Kings Canyon, and one desert park. Um, we ran a total of, oh gosh, about 60 half-day to three-day workshops at these locations. Um, I led them personally with one or two people from my lab, and we reached um, eight or 900 participants who were trained in phenological monitoring, um, although of course a much smaller fraction, a much smaller fraction of those people um, actually dived in and made it part of their life's work. Um, but setting up and uh, implementing the uh, these monitoring programs required some local hero, um, usually a park member, park staff member, who would supervise and allow um, students and volunteers to work on this project. Um, but on the ground, this work was done by um, oh several several hundred over the years volunteers who just were keen to contribute to this. Um, the work has also been extended to several of the University of California Natural Reserve Systems uh, sites, um, simply owing to the interest of their volunteers. Um, again, if you're interested in exploring uh, the CPP a little bit more, uh, check out our website where you can meet all of the species that we're targeting. You can learn about um, each of the parks and the species and locations where we're monitoring plants. Um, and you can learn about um, our partners, including two local ones at Santa Barbara Botanic Garden and Sedgwick Natural Reserve, where um, volunteers are, are working to report the phenological status of our focal wild plant species. Um, and we have a number of educational materials also that we developed in my lab, ranging from elementary school phenology education activities to university seminars and uh, research-related courses. Um, so in a nutshell, we're monitoring 30 species, um, eight of which are monitored in multiple parks, but even of those species that we're only monitoring in single parks, we're monitoring them across um, aridity gradients or elevation gradients that allow us to capture quite a bit of climatic variation. We tagged, mapped, and are monitoring over 1,000 individual plants. These are woody species, so we can look at interannual year-to-year variation in their phenology and its relationship to annual changes in, uh, in climate. Um, we've contributed over 1.5 million observations to the USA National Phenology Network, which maintains the database to which all of this standardized data um, are contributed. And I just want to show you very briefly how after three years of data collection, we can now detect relationships between phenophase onset dates, the first day of the year when a plant flowers or its buds break, and local rainfall and monthly mean temperature. Um, first, I just want to introduce you to a few of the, the cast here. Um, we knew, for example, that we weren't going to be able to do phenological monitoring in Joshua Tree National Park without monitoring Joshua Tree, so that was an easy selection. And I just, uh, I won't do this for every species, but I just wanted to um, share with you some of the criteria that were important for us when we were selecting species for monitoring. So by example, Joshua Tree is an iconic species. Everyone knows it, good candidate. It's an indicator for the Mojave Desert. It's also the focus of a wide range of current scientific questions. Juveniles are relatively rare, so it's a species of local management concern. Um, its populations are nearby to other monitoring efforts like met meteorological stations, um, so we knew that we could get good climate data. It has an easy ability to engage the public. 
Um, the plants are relatively accessible. They grow near trails. Their fruits are maybe a little less accessible, but we got around that. Um, California buckeye, another really easy choice. It produces these honking, beautiful leaf, leaf buds that anyone can recognize, so easy to teach people how to monitor it. The flowers are beautiful and obvious and also produces you know, really, really impressive fruit. Creosote bush, another a little bit less charismatic species, unless you look up close and personal and like, how cute is that? Um, and one of the remarkable things is that we would train people in the desert who had seen creosote booth, uh, bush for years and years and never had much affinity for it. But once they started looking at its phenological phases, uh, their eyes just opened to the details and nuances that they had been missing. And that is really, uh, it's a transformational process to see someone who's seen a plant their whole lives see something new for the first time. And this happened to me with every species that I taught. I thought I knew these species, and I didn't. California buckwheat, another great example of the same. Um, blue elderberry, widespread. We knew we'd be able to capture a lot of climatic variation. Coast live oak, coyote brush. Um, interesting question here. This species has female plants and male plants. What happens if the females respond differently to climate, climate change than the males? They might miss each other. I don't think Match.com could help that very much. We created a bunch of um, materials just to facilitate um, training people on these 30 species. So we had these species profiles, which contained factoids and hints and nice photographs of the different phenophases to assist people. Collecting data is quite easy. One fills out data sheets. Do you see young leaves? Yes, no. What's the date? Very straightforward. Um, <coughs> if you're under 30 and can't imagine filling out a paper data sheet anymore. Yes, there's an app, and this is run um, by the USA NPN. And you can get the app, Nature's Notebook, on, on iTunes. And it's not, it's not hard to use. And now, with respect to those data and uh, those analyses that I wanted to just very briefly introduce you to, um, I collaborated with um, a couple of colleagues to investigate um, to use data from the California Phenology Project and the National Phenology Network to investigate responses to climate of four species of oak in North America. Now, the California Phenology Project had been observing coast live oak and valley oak, and the National Phenology Network participants had targeted red oak and white oak for um, uh, recording the day of year of appearance of opening leaf buds, so bud break, and the appearance of open flowers, namely the male catkins. Um, the two California species um, are um, restricted to the western edge, of western side of the state, while the two eastern species extend from the Midwest to the eastern seaboard. And I'm just going to show you very briefly the kinds of patterns that we've detected and are continuing to explore. So these two panels show the relationship just in coast live oak between a climatic variable, which as we go from the left hand to the right hand side of the x-axis, represents increases in temperature and decreases in precipitation. In other words, at each of these locations, um, plants were monitored across an array of uh, climatic conditions that gets hotter and drier as we go from, west, uh, from um, left to right. Along the y-axis is the day of the year from 1 to 365, but we only needed to show up to 200, of the day of year that leaf buds break or that flower and flower buds appear. So in Coast Live Oak, there's absolutely no relationship between the time of year when leaf buds break and local temperature conditions. Uh, same species with respect to flower buds opening, there's a slight trend, not quite statistically significant, between um, increases in temperature and uh, drought and um, flowering time, where they begin to accelerate or advance their flowering time in response to heat. The other California species, Lobata or Valley Oak, showed sort of the opposite pattern. 
Their bud break is sensitive to temperature and precipitation, but their flowering time isn't. Well, how do these two species compare to the East Coast species? We had actually thought that the West Coast species would be more sensitive to precipitation because we're in such a water-limited system. Why wouldn't species respond, or populations respond, or individuals respond by flowering as soon as they got enough water? But we found actually the opposite pattern. The top two panels are white oak, the bottom two panels are red oak, and for both phenophases, both species show much greater sensitivity to temperature and to precipitation than the California species. So both groups of oaks respond to warmer and drier conditions by advancing vegetative bud break and or flowering, but the California oaks appear to be much less sensitive to warmer, drier conditions across their range. Maybe this is because they're so deep-rooted that they've got their water or not based on the depth of their roots, not based on what's happening um, through rainfall. I would also point out, and I haven't shown these data for you, um, is that individual California oak trees have multiple episodes of bud break and flowering throughout the winter and spring, while trees of the eastern oaks exhibit only a single event. They're much more highly synchronized. So that's another fundamental biological difference that might contribute to their very different phenological behavior in uh, response to climate, uh, climatic variation and potentially to future climate change. Okay, so um, I forgot to turn on my timer, so you'll just be here until I'm gone. Um, <laughs> Uh, final project, I think I'm okay, um, that I wanted to present briefly is a specimen-based project with my colleague and collaborator, Dr. Isaac Park, where we're harnessing the power of herbarium specimens collected over the last century to detect climate-driven change in floral resources for pollinators and other animals. Uh, we just started this project six months ago, so I'm just going to show you the tip of the iceberg of the kinds of analyses that we're beginning to conduct and the questions that we're going to ask. So most of you know for sure that herbarium specimens, these, plant, these pressed dry plants, are very valuable for determining the geographic distributions of plant species and for assessing variation within and between species, to discover new species, to rename species, and to check the work of um, historical botanists. Now, there are about 50,000 specimens held in U.S. herbaria that have been used for these purposes. But what you might not know is that herbarium specimens are also a growing and very rich resource for detecting the effects of climate on flowering time. Um, and with a bunch of colleagues, I've reviewed um, this field in a very recently published paper. Now, although there are 50 million of these specimens, only about 5 million of them um, have information that is available online. So the information of about 5 million of those 50 million are available in online databases. The bad news is that in many cases, only information from the label is available. But the good news is that a perfect label provides a treasure of information. And so here's an herbarium specimen label, if you've never had the pleasure of seeing one of these. Um, they contain latitude and longitude, a given, uh, the collection date of a given specimen, and sometimes, often, the reproductive status of the specimen. Now, thanks to long-term climatic data sets that are available for almost every point in the nation, this information here on the label offers us the opportunity to track the effects of historical climatic conditions on the timing of flowering if we assume that the collection date is a good proxy for the first flowering date of that plant specimen. So there's some slop there, but it turns out that um, there's more signal to the data than there is noise. So we've got noise, which we admit to, but happily the signal that, um, signals that we see are fairly strong. And I'll show you, I'll give you just a very small taste of those signals. 
So what we know from what people have done before is that there are about 35 herbarium-based studies that have detected strong effects of local climatic conditions, say annual rainfall or temperature, on the first flowering date, FFD, of individual species. However, little is known about how climate influences the collective property of regional or local plant communities. So what's a collective property? A collective property includes elements such as the duration of the flowering season. That's not something that an individual plant specimen can tell us. And if we're interested in whole plant communities, we need to know about the flowering times of all of their component species. Another collective attribu attribute would be the degree of flowering synchrony among species. As successive se species begin to flower at a given location, are those flowering dates compressed or are they extended? So how um, synchronous are those flowering times? And finally, um, how rapidly do plants successively initiate flowering? So for example, does the first 50% of plants that flower does that occur in the first 5% of the flowering season? Or does it take 90% of the flowering season for 50% of the plants to flower? And I'll propose some reasons why it might be of interest to know the answer to those kind of nerdy questions, right? Um, in the next few minutes, I'm just going to focus on this question. How does climate influence the rate at which species successively initiate flowering? So you've got species one that starts flowering, then the next species starts flowering, then the next species starts flowering. How rapidly does that occur? Okay, so what Isaac and I did um, was to identify 51 local climatic regions in the continental U.S., within each of which the climatic conditions are relatively homogeneous, so these are relatively small regions. And more importantly, we wanted to... Um, uh, be able to characterize these local regions fairly with some confidence. So we only wanted to use a given region if there were more than 100 species, each of which was represented by multiple herbarium specimens. And so these regions are shown in bright red here. They're scattered across the US. Of course, they're herbarium specimens representing the entire continent, but we had these pretty um, stringent um, criteria for allowing us to investigate a given local climatic region. So what we did was we used records that started out with 874,000 herbarium specimens representing 2,800 species and subspecies collected over the last century. We uh, filtered those to use only those that had good flowering dates, good latitude longitudes that had really good label data. Um, and we estimated the average or the mean first flowering date for each taxon, species or subspecies, in each region. And then we examined the frequency distributions of these first flowering dates among all of the taxa that were in a similar climate. And then we asked, as I mentioned, how does, in this case, the mean annual temperature of a region influence the distribution of first flowering dates among its successively flowering species? And I'll state the pattern, and then I'll show you the data. What we found first was that as temperature increases across the continent, the variation in first flowering among taxa also increases, and the distribution of first flowering dates become bimodal. So what does this look like in pictures? So this is a frequency distribution of the percent of species that reach first flowering in all of the regions pooled where the mean annual temperature was less than 5 degrees centigrade. So those, these are cold sites. And so you see that most um, species flower, begin to flower at about day 198, so the end of June. Um, and this frequency distribution contains um, 179 species. And the um, uh, amount of time between the first and the last flowering species is about 100 days. So that's one frequency distribution for one climatic condition. And that's shown here again. Now we lumped all of the local regions um, where the mean annual temperature was 5 to 10 degrees centigrade, 10 to 15 degrees centigrade, 15 to 20, and greater than 20 degrees centigrade. And you can see here illustrated the point that I just made in words. As mean annual temperature increases, 
first the um, mean day of first flower becomes um, advanced by over three months from day 198 to day 109. But more interestingly to us, the spread of first flowering dates becomes much more extended in the warmer climate and bimodal. And it makes us wonder whether these species that flower towards the end of, se of the season might be at a bit of risk because there are fewer species to attract pollinators, or alternatively, maybe they have a mating system su such as self-fertilization that allows them to get away with flowering even when there isn't a huge mm, a attracting community, community of flowering plants attracting pollinators. So we don't know that um, the future will necessarily bring more taxa, uh, more communities um, uh, into flowering periods that look like this distribution, but this is the way that we would make this prediction. We would use um, spatial variation in climate and the phenological patterns that we see across these different climates to make inferences about what the whole community might be doing with respect to their flowering times. There's one other way that we um, use this result, that use these data that I wanted to share with you, and I'll say it in words and then show it in pictures. Within these local climatic regions, the amount of time required relative to the length of the flowering season for each of six sequential groups of taxa to flower was highly sensitive to mean annual temperature. So here we're asking, okay, how fast did the first 10% of species flower? How fast do the next 15% of species flower? How fast do the next 15% flower? So these different cohorts, what's happening to them as a function of mean annual temperature? Okay, so here along the x-axis, we show for each of those local climatic regions, it's mean annual temperature. And on the y-axis, we're asking a mouthful. We're asking, how does the proportion of the flowering season that's required for the 20th to 35th percentile of species, so this is like the, the second 15% of species, to flower? And um, as the mean annual temperature of the local climate increases, the amount of time required for this group of species to flower significantly declines. In other words, as regions get warmer, this group of flowering plants, not the first flowering, but sort of the mid-flowering species, start their flowering times get compressed. The same thing is true for the next cohort, the 36th to 50th percentile. As the climate gets warmer, their flowering times get compressed. But when we look at the end of the season, the 80th to 95th percentile of species, the exact opposite pattern emerges. Those species start flowering slower and slower relative to each other. So we're grappling with what this means. No one has looked at these community level attributes before. So we know that local climate affects the collective properties of the flowering times of regional floras. As mean annual temperature increases, the flowering dates of successively flowering species become compressed during the first half of the flowering season. Maybe this means that there'll be stronger competition for pollinators. Maybe some plants will suffer because they, their competition is too strong and the pollinators won't visit them. On the other end of the spectrum, flowering onset dates become extended during the final 20% of the flowering season. It takes longer for sequentially flowering species to flower. And this could mean that maybe that end of the season is going to become a floral desert, or maybe only self-pollinating species will be able to, or clonally reproducing species, will be able to make it at that time of year. So we know, too, that the number and diversity of co-flowering plant species are affected by climate. That's the consequence of this compression and extension of the flowering dates. Um, and for the first time, I feel we know that community-level phenological properties will change in response to climate. Um, and that this means that the diversity of co-flowering or synchronously flowering species that are available for pollinators, for floral herbivores, for nectar-hunting insects and birds, for nectar robbers, at any given time during the flowering season will also change. So I hope that this introduction may give you 
some new insights or just new things to think about when you see a scene like this. I hope you'll start thinking about how will the species that you see here evolve from ancestral to descendant populations, generations? How will the phenology of each species shift in response to future climate change? And what will that mean for the species with which those species interact? And finally, how will the number and diversity of species that are available to pollinators for pollen and nectar, and fruits of course, change across the season? Certainly, helping to direct and to design and implement these programs has made me think about these questions in ways that I really didn't just 10 years ago. And so I hope you can um, not waste all the time I wasted by not thinking about <laughs> these questions. And finally, I want to um, thank my partners in crime, uh, Julie Ederson and Steve Franks, the other Project Baseline um, leaders and our postdoctoral champions in the field. My California Phenology Project um, collaborators and colleagues here at UCSB and in the National Phenology Network office in Tucson. And then finally, of course, um, Isaac. So thank you so much again, and um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. <laughs>